current president, Mark Juergensmeyer. And I want to start with some highlights from a very impressive, unpadded, nine-page Vita. From it, we learn that Mark has had a career that spans the, the Pacific, beginning in Berkeley, at UC Berkeley and the GTU, extending to the University of Hawaii, and then returning to the West Coast with his appointment at UC Santa Barbara, where he's currently a professor in two departments, sociology and global studies, and affiliated with a third in religious studies. He's also the director of the Orfila Center for Global and International Studies, which he founded with the support of the local businessman who started the Kinko's copy stores, and which has recently received a large grant from the Luce Foundation to look at the impact of re that religion has had on international humanitarian efforts. Mark is an expert on religious violence, conflict resolution, and South Asian religion and politics. He's published more than 200 articles and 20 books, including the recently released Global Rebellion, Religious Challenges to the Secular State. He's perhaps best known, however, for Terror in the Mind of God, the Global Rise of Religious Violence, which was published two years after 9-11 and is based on interviews with religious activists from around the world, including individuals convicted of the 1993 World Trade Center bombing leaders of Hamas, and abortion clinic bombers in the United States. He's also written on the confrontation between religious activists and secular states and published a primer on Gandhian conflict resolution complete with his own cartoon style illustrations. He edited the Oxford Handbook of Global Religion and also the Encycl uh, Religion in Global Civil Society and he's co-editing an encyclopedia of global religions. He gave the Stafford Lectures at Princeton University in 2006 on the topic of God and war, and they're forthcoming as a book from Princeton University Press. In his spare time, he lectures all over the world and writes for religion dispatches and the imminent frame. So you may be wondering, how does one become this kind of person? Well, I asked him. And here's how he described his intellectual journey. He began, he says, as a pious Protestant in a German immigrant community in the Midwest, was transformed by Reinhold Niebuhr. He said he was literally his last student at Union Seminary. And by Gandhi, whom he read in seminary, and by working with the poor in food for work projects organized by Gandhian followers in India after seminary. And then by Marx, while working on his PhD in political science at Berkeley during the 60s, which makes him, as he sums it up, a sort of pious, radical, pacifist, realist, or something. But pious, radical, pacifist, realist is one, just one dimension of what all who know him recognize as a distinct and complex personality. There are at least two other dimensions that I'd like to highlight, one obvious and the other less so. We can call them the entrepreneur and the poet. Mark's entrepreneurial streak is pretty obvious, even legendary. He's been at the right place at the right time on many occasions and has not hesitated to seize the moment. He has not hesitated to speak out in a post 9-11 world based on his long-standing interest in religion, violence, and peacemaking He's not hesitated when it came to the networking and fundraising to create and sustain a thriving center on campus. Nor has he hesitated when it came to acquiring choice pieces of real estate. Here too, his abilities are legendary, though I've only personally seen two of his purchases. The one in Hawaii, overlooking the ocean, and the one in Santa Barbara, overlooking the ocean. <laughs> what is Less obvious, but is hinted at in publications tucked away in his vita, is his love of poetry and his facility in translating Hindu poetry into English. Back in the 80s, for example, he published selections from the poetry of Indian devotional writers that he co-translated with Jack Hawley, a friend since his seminary days. 
and his interest and his skills have not withered away in the intervening years. In Jack Hawley's new book of translations of 16th century poems devoted to Krishna, he credits Mark with teaching him more than anyone else about the art of translating poetry and with reviewing every poem that appears in the book. Tonight, the scholar, pious, radical, pacifist, realist, entrepreneur, and poet will bring his multitude of talents to his presidential address, Beyond Words and War, The Global Future of Religion. Let's welcome Mark Jurgensmeyer. Well, thanks, Anne. That was a truly wonderful introduction. And to all of you, welcome, and happy birthday, AR. This is truly a wonderful occasion. This is our 100th uh, birthday, uh, and it's been 100 years of extraordinary uh, and interesting developments in the study of religion. And just looking over back at the 100 years through which we've been as scholars of religion makes us wonder what we will be studying 100 years from now. What will the future bring? To try to understand that, that means trying to understand this extraordinary subject, religion, and where we've been and where we might be going. So let's begin at the beginning. 100 years ago, in 1909, the world looked quite different. At that time, the study of religion was the study of words, specifically sacred texts, and the study of one text in particular, the Bible. A society of biblical literature and exegesis had been established some years earlier, some 20 years earlier than that. And this is, of course, the organization we know now as the SBL. And it was four members of that group who met on a particular occasion uh, during one of the Society for Biblical Literature and Exegesis meetings who came together and had a different kind of vision. They decided they needed a different kind of organization. One of them was Ismar Peretz of Syrac Syracuse University, and he persuaded three of his colleagues, one from Columbia University, one from Smith, one from Mount Holyoke, to come together at a meeting in Union Theological Seminary in 1909 to establish a different kind of organization. And by the way, I couldn't find the actual pictures of all of these people, so these are approximations. So if you really know what Ismar Paris looks like, don't tell me that isn't him, because I know that, I know that. Uh, but in any event, use your imagination. He could have looked like that. <laughs> Okay, after truth in, 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 in telling, let me continue. So anyway, they, 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 met, it, they met to try to, to, uh, to create a different kind of organization. And they called it the Association of Biblical Instructors in American Colleges and Secondary Schools. And they later renamed it the National Association of Biblical Instructors, or NABI for short. And those of you who know Hebrew or those of you who know Arabic, Arabic know that NABI means prophet in both of those languages. And it was this association that later would be renamed the American Academy of Religion. Now, why did they do this? Well, for that, we have to go to the words of one of the founding four, Olive Dutcher from Smith College. And if you're surprised that at that time a woman would be considered as a professional equal, I should point out that there were quite a large number of women in the early organizations that preceded the AAR. Uh, in fact, um, they were much more than any other academic at the association at the time, and, and a number of them, in fact, served as presidents. But why did they establish this separate organization? Now, some 40 years later, when Olive Dutcher wrote a letter to um, kind of centenary, not a centenary, but a 40th anniversary of the establishment of this organization uh, at Hebrew University uh, College in Cincinnati, she wrote a letter explaining its purposes. And this is what she said. She said they wanted to organize a new kind of association that would be especially for those faculty who taught the Bible in secular institutions in order to demonstrate, as she put it, that careful scholarship 
was as much a sine qua non for teaching biblical material as it was for teaching any other subject, such as history or literature. So their mission was on the one hand to encourage scholarship and teaching that was, as she said, free from doctrinal, doctrinal bias. And on the other hand, Olive Dutcher explained, they wanted to bring biblical insights into the secular world. She put it this way, she said since 19, 1900, she said men have been born into a world of insecurity where life has been nothing but change. And this is in 1949. And of course, during these later years especially, she said, the world seemed to be rocking beneath their feet. In such a climate, she said, they needed Isaiah's stern serenity, she said, and Deutero Isaiah's tender and jubilant assurances. So they needed biblical history, as she put it, for out of no other history has come such discipline and enduring sense of rock formations. So they wanted to create an association for secular institutions that would bring the values of religious-related scholarship into the secular world. Olive Dutcher wrote these words at the end of a great world war that had transformed global society. It was indeed a time when the world was rocking beneath their feet. And in the time after the establishment of the first organization that became the AER, in the 1930s, for example, it was a time of great economic depression, a time for movements for economic justice. It was a time of great threats to world peace and security, a time when Hitler on the far left and uh, Stalin and his dictatorial domination of Russia on the far left and Hitler's manic Nazism on the far right uh, challenged one's sense of global civility. So biblical scholarship and religious studies in this period didn't sit idly by. New prophetic voices emerged from the halls of the academic study of religion, including the Christian realist Reinhold Niebuhr, my former teacher, the Jewish convert to Catholicism and socialism Simone Weil, and the existentialist prophets Martin Buber and Paul Tillich. So as the century came to a fulcrum point, the time of World War II, old empires began to crumble and new nations came into being. The cultural traditions of these regions, what came to be known in the Cold War as the Third World, needed to be taken seriously. And this meant more than anything understanding their religion, their religious practices, their institutions and communities. So suddenly the study of Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, and Sikhism began to blossom. And there was a study of religion that developed a richness far from the old Orientalist narrow concerns with the Bible and the sacred texts of the East. Western scholars now physically went to different parts of the world to try to understand the rituals, the myths, the beliefs of these interesting new re regions. And religion increasingly become, was becoming world religions. And the study of religion gained new academic respectability. It became the study of the diversity of the world's cultures and what had become the new international epoch in the post-World War II era. And the field became a strategic partner in America's global concerns with the potential dominance of international communism over the third world. Religious studies departments were established at major universities and secular universities such as Lancaster in the UK and at the University of California, my own branch of the Santa Barbara campus. The field was booming and seemingly expanding exponentially. So, in 1963, the old NABI, the National Association of Biblical Instructors, had become really quite a different organization. It was filled with scholars with all sorts of new specializations, such as sociology and anthropology of religion, and those who studied not only Christianity and Judaism, but also Hinduism and Buddhism and Islam. Clearly, a reassess reassessment was in order. And a self-study committee of the NABI recommended that they have a new name. And the name was instituted in 1964, and they called themselves the American Academy of Religion. Now, it's a grand name, 
which you might think is a bit odd, if you stop to think about it, it's not self-evident. Is it American in the sense of the United States or North America or the Americas? Uh, the word academy suggests a kind of institution. Academy of religion could be a place that pertains or propagates religion. So it's not entirely clear if you look at each of the words, but together, I think it's a marvelous phrase. Because together, I think it lets us understand that academy suggests both a community of scholars and the academic study of religion. And of course, we can regard America in as provincial or as worldwide terms as we want to make it. And increasingly, America is becoming more global. The pace of globalization in the world in general increased rapidly after the end of the Cold War. In 1989, when the Berlin Wall came tumbling down and the Soviet Empire collapsed, new cultural and political forces were unleashed around the world. One of these forces was a religious activism associated with new nationalist movements. Another was an intense religious conservatism that was often branded as fundamentalism and the rise of the Ayatollah Khomeini's Islamic Revolution in Iran in 1979 seemed at the time to be an anomaly in the expected march of secularism in world history. The Carter administration at the time couldn't imagine that these strange mullahs had political aspirations. But by 1990s, the secular march took an about face in the confrontation of a strident and many strident new forms of political religiosity. And for many of us, including myself, the study of religion became the study of social conflict. We began to see religion increasingly in a socio-political as well as private terms. We sought to make sense of the way that many contemporary political movements have been animated by religious ideas and images, and perhaps no idea and an image of religion has been quite so awesome of that of cosmic war. And we try to understand why these movements were emerging now in such strident fashion at the end of the Cold War and during the rise of globalization. Many of us came to the conclusion that religion was not the problem, at least not if you think of religion as the repository of religious ideas and customs that have been passed down through generations. Rather, the problem was secularism, or perhaps the notion that there is such a thing as secularism, and the erosion of confidence in the Western notion of secular nationalism as the sole ideological buttress of the idea of the nation state. So now, here we are in the 21st century, a world that is postmodern, post-national, post-secular, and post-Cold War. One would think that the time has never been more ripe to study religion. And to a large extent, this is the case. Our field has more public media attention and new opportunities for research funding, funding than ever before. New positions and programs have been created across the country. The membership of the American Academy of Religion has expanded in quantum leaps in the last 15 years. And there are now over 11,000 members, if you count just those whose dues are paid up, if you include those who in the last several years have let their dues lapse, it's more like 18,000. This is a number more than the Association of Philosophers, equal to or more than anthropologists. If you include the 8,500 members of the, our sister organization, the SBL, SBL, the Society for Biblical Literature, then you have well over 20,000, which would make it perhaps the largest professional association uh, in, in the United States except for economists and the Modern Language Association that includes uh, English teachers and teachers of foreign languages. It is an extraordinary group of people and studying religion has become big business. The only problem is that increasingly we're uncertain what it is that we're studying. What is this thing, religion, as a subject for study by the scholarly community. Because in 19, it's because in the 21st century, no longer in the 1900s, the idea of religion has become a contested term. Anything can be religion. McDonald's can be, become a religion. 
And we become increasingly persuaded that even the concept of religion is something odd, something peculiarly Western and distinctly modern. As early as 1962, we were told that religion was linguistically a new invention. And we were warned to be wary of its use. We learned this from an influential book, The Meaning and End of Religion, by Wilfred Cantwell Smith, a great Canadian Islamicist who came from McGill just down the street, and a historian of religion who helped to shape Harvard's program in the study of religion and once served as the president of the AAR. Wilfred Smith recommended that we avoid the use of religion as a noun, as if religion itself were a reified thing, and we use it only in the adjectival form to, to describe religious ideas, for instance, or religious myths. Smith pointed out that prior to the Enlightenment, the terms faith and tradition of religion were more commonly used, and the idea of religion is a distinctly modern invention. More recently, more recently scholars such as Talal Assad and Charles Taylor, who's another great Canadian thinker, have shown that in the secular age, the idea of religion is inextricably bound up with the idea of secularism, and that these twin notions are both modern constructs idiosyncratic to the West. In Europe and the United States, many of us are unconsciously affected by what Charles Taylor has described as the grand narrative involving secularism in the spread of modernization and in the historical track of European and American progress. The term religion was not one that was frequently used even by Christians until the Enlightenment's secular religious distinction. The or or origins of the term religion are, are somewhat uncertain. Now, some say that comes from the Latin relego, to read again or to repeat. Some say it comes from the Latin religari, to bind anew as with a contract or cover, covenant. Others say it comes from the Latin res legari with regard to a gathering such as a religious festival or a group, but in its modern post-enlightenment usage, it's an ideological construct of beliefs joined with an institutionalized community. And in this sense, religion works only as a term in juxtaposition with secularism. It is used to demarcate the ideas, practices, beliefs, and institutions that are related to a particular faith and tradition within the sea of secularism that has a name such as Christianity and can be labeled as a religion. And the word religion, for that reason, cannot easily be translated into any non-European language. This is, this is something I discovered myself when as a graduate student I went to India to do research on the religion of untouchables. It was my first project, my first book, the untouchables are the lowest caste in the Hindu, Hindu social hierarchy. In order to try to under, understand how they thought and how they saw religion within their movements for social change, I came armed with a 60-question survey questionnaire that I was going to present to the village untouchables in the North Indian state of Punjab. Well, I have to tell you, I had difficulty with the first question and the whole thing collapsed when I got to the second. The first question was, what is your name? Pretty simple, pretty straightforward. The problem is if you're an untouchable, you have a different name, depending whether you're responding to Muslims or Hindus or Sikhs, or you might use your caste name, or you might use your village name. They wanted to know what you wanted to know so they could give you the right answer. What kind of name is it that you want? We'll give you the right name. So I had problems with that question. But by the time I got to the second, the whole thing fell apart. What, I asked them, is your religion? Well, I tried to ask that question, although even the help, with the help of my Punjabi tutors, I, I, I couldn't come up with any single word. My, my tutors turned to me and said, what, 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 do, what do you mean? And I said, you know, religion. And they said, yeah, but what do you mean? I mean, you could use the word calm to 
denote a large social identity, or you could use muzhab, which means a series of beliefs, or you could talk about punt, the fellowship of believers around a religious teacher, or you could use dharma, the idea of a social, mor social moral order. Just what is it that you have in mind? What was it that I did have in mind? There was no word in any of India's 16 languages for what we call religion. So the word religion makes sense only in the modern Western context, where it is in tandem with its twin concept, secularism. And neither makes sense without the other. The interesting thing is, as an invented term, which came about in, during the Enlightenment, it was it, 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 it and its twin term, seculum, of an age, which related to the French word, word secle, meaning century or age, both come from Latin terms that were related to kinds of clergy, which is interesting. Religious, for example, was a kind of clergy who was uh, attached to a religious order and was therefore religious. And a secular clergy was someone who served in a worldly local parish and was therefore secular. So this distinction which existed before the Middle Ages, the secular religious, somehow then became appropriated for two kinds, this distinction of two kinds of clerical roles became appropriated for two kinds of social order, religious and secular, in which the life of the church and the clergy was limited only to the former. So in the two centuries in which the Enlightenment's secular religious distinction has been prominent in European American thought, it's accepted as, commonplace, as a commonplace dichotomy. So common that we just can't imagine it not existing. So common that I couldn't imagine not asking this question to a group of untouchables in the Punjab. It's still not clear exactly what the distinction demarcates. Is it a distinction between two different kinds of authority, secular religious, or way of keeping religion out of public life? Or is it a division between two different ways of thinking about social order and social and ultimate reality? That is to say, are there religious and secular persons? And I think this is the way that Jawaharlal Nehru in India came to think about it when after India's independence, he advocated a new social order in India based on the bedrock of socialism and secularism. In his way of thinking, secularism was the emergence of non-communal and a reasonable civic order, a prerequisite to modernization and the entrance into the family of nation states. It was, in the way that Charles Taylor has described it, a secular way of being. And today, Secularism has become, for many, a cherished ideal. In Denmark recently, where the protest of some Muslims against what they regarded as the vilification of the Prophet Muhammad in a series of cartoons published in a Copenhagen newspaper, was met with a clamor of voices from concerned Danish citizens and citizens throughout Europe defending the hallmark of secularism, freedom of speech. In Turkey, in 2007, when Islamic parties gained power, hundreds of thousands of Turks marched in Istanbul and Ankara in order to protect their defense of secularism. In the minds of many secular Turks, they did not want to abandon the elements of modern life that they regarded as essential to their secular and therefore implicitly European Turkish identities. So since so much of the contemporary social conflict is, to, is linked to the ideas of secularism and religion, and the notion that religion somehow confronts the secular world, it's appropriate to rethink the categories of religion and secularism that make this conflict possible. Now through a multi-year project which is sponsored by the Social Science Research Council, a group of diverse scholars have collaborated in a reconsideration of secularism, rethinking secularism in the secular order in the context of the contemporary world. And tomorrow here in this room, we'll have a plenary panel on the topic with several members of the group, including Charles Taylor, Jose Casanova, 
Saba Mahmood, and the SSRC president, Craig Calhoun, uh, and myself will participate. In our SSRC working group, we have tried to raise some fundamental questions about this idea of secularism. To what degree is it a concept shaped solely by the European historical experience? To what extent does it carry the baggage of Western, specifically Christian, notions of moral order? To what extent are the idea of religion and secularism twin concepts to speak really to similar moral sensibilities? Is there currently a decline in secularism, or is there a reformulation of the secular religious distinction? Can the distinction be transcended in new ways of thinking about the moral basis of civil society and political order? And will the rethinking of secularism require rethinking about religion? And this is where the questions come back to us. So if we reject the idea that there's a clear secular religious distinction, if we live in a post-secular age, where does that leave us in studying religion? Is Wilfred Smith right that there's no there there? There's no religion to be studied. Besides the fragmented artifacts of the religious imagination, the rituals and sacred texts, the social identities and political conflicts, is there anything else left? Is there something to religion besides words and war? I think that there is. And by that, I don't mean God or the transcendent or some other term that, they don't, that demarcates divine power. I think whatever that entity is and what do we imagine it to be, it's beyond our capacity to study it. By definition, a god cannot be studied. And I agree with Dietrich Bonhoeffer and with many other religious thinkers who say that religious thought and practice is a human activity, a creation of humans, perhaps a response to a perception of divine transcendence, but nonetheless a human perception. And so it seems to me that even if transcendence cannot be studied, the human perception of it can. It is these religious perceptions that coalesce, coalesce around grand notions of social reality that produce powerful ways of looking at the world. I suggest we could call these perceptions epistemic worldviews, a term that evokes Michel Foucault's concept of episteme, a paradigm of linguistic discourse based on a common set of understandings about the basic basis of knowledge. One can add to this Pierre Bordeaux's notion of habitus, the social location of shared understandings about the world and how it should work. Put these together, and one has a notion of epistemic worldviews to describe what we have previously talked of as a religious outlook on life. And they can also describe a secular or a nationalist or a socialist outlook on life. They are the meaningful connections in someone's way of viewing the world. And that's one of the things that we scholars of religious studies always have done. We've studied epistemic worldviews. Some years ago, my colleague Ninian Smart suggested that we should abandon the name religious studies and Call it instead worldview analysis. So and the reason why he suggested that is, is that he thought that what we do well as religious studies scholars in reference to the traditions and customs and ways of thinking that are defined as religions could be applied to all aspects of life, to politics or to other ideologies. Like Wilfred Cantwell Smith, he thought that secular humanism was also a religion. Smith called it philosophia, a great religion of humankind. And so is nationalism and state socialism. These are all worthy ways of thinking about the epistemic worldviews and the power in which they have over the human imagination. So in religious studies, when we analyze the epistemic worldview aspect of our religious artifacts that we study, we bring a philosophic and theological sensitivity to ways of thinking about reality, as well as a whole range of humanistic and social scientific methods for understanding the importance of whatever we study, authority, identity, ideas, history, images, myths, 
within a perception of the world. And that's, it seems to me, what makes what we do so value to the whole of academia, to the whole of the social sciences and humanities and the whole range of intellectual activity within our scholarly settings. And these other fields desperately need the depth of epistemic analysis that religious studies brings to its intellectual inquiries. And let me give you an example. Recently, I've been working with a young colleague of mine, Mona Sheikh, who's a former newspaper columnist and a PhD student at the University of Copenhagen in Denmark. This last year, she's been a research center at uh, Santa Barbara in the, in the research scholar uh, in Santa Barbara in the center that I direct. And Mona has been working on the rise of radical jihadi Islamic movements in Pakistan, which is the country from which her parents emigrated. And because she's ethnically Punjabi and she speaks fluent Urdu, she's been able to interview some of the top leaders of the Taliban and other militant jihadi movements in the Pakistan and Afghanistan regions. Extraordinary interviews. She's discovered, among other things, that the situation is much more complex than any simple notion of an imagined United Taliban would suggest. She, there, she identifies some 29 different groups that could be regarded as Taliban. Some of them are religious wackos. Some of them are, are uh, you know, uh, uh, th thieves. Uh, some of them are uh, old tribal leaders. Uh, some of them are thugs. Some of them we can negotiate with. Some we can't. It certainly makes more problematic the American military strategies in the region over which President Obama is contemplating at this very moment. And it certainly complicates the idea of winning in any simple sense. But also in doing her analysis, she has been frustrated with many of the social science approaches to studying religious movements. They often tend to discount the importance of religious belief. They trivialize what it seems to her is crucial in trying to understand the worldview, the organization, the motivation, the source of authority for the movements. I share Mona's concern. And I found some of the same limitations in my own work on the rise of religious activism around the world. So we've gone on a search for analytic approaches to the study of religious movements that would appreciate the role of religious ideas and practices. And we found quite a few many within the field of religious studies, and others, including the reflective sociology of someone like Robert Bella or the political theology of Carl Schmitt, models for thinking about the inner relationship of religious ideas to social situations that is found by more reflective social scientists and humanists as well as by those for whom religious studies is their main field. They have embraced, without describing it as such, what I've just now been calling epistemic worldview analysis. Increasingly, it seems to me, this is, a, is an approach that will come more naturally within the field, which comes so naturally in the field of religious, uh, religious studies, will become recognized in other areas of the humanities and, and, so, and social sciences as a legitimate and important model for the study of, of, of socially engaged religious activists and movements. So to encourage this adoption of, religious, of a religious studies approach to contemporary society, we began to talk about the socio-theological turn in the study of social movements. We've invented the term sociology, social theology to characterize a fusion of social studies with a non-confessional theological analysis. It's theological in the sense that it incorporates the insider-oriented attempt to understand the reality of a particular worldview and tries to do what the field of theology has classically done long before the advent of the modern academic disciplines, structure the social, ethical, political, and spiritual aspects of a culture's and ideas and meanings into a coherent whole. The power of theology as an academic discipline used to be its comprehensiveness. It attempted to survey the whole range of human activity, to ground it in first principles. And for this reason, theology was once regarded as the queen of the sciences. Such diverse thinkers in European history as Adam Smith, 
who is widely regarded as the father of modern capitalist economic theory. Charles Darwin, one of the fathers of evolutionary biology, began their intellectual careers studying theology. The same is true of many of the most influential sciences from the Islamic culture, such as Ibn Sina, who is regarded as the father of modern medicine and creator of the concept of momentum in physics. Ibn Hayyan, known as the father of molecular chemistry, Al-Khwarizmi and Al-Kindi, who invented algebra. Common for their scientific approach was that they all studied, went into dialogue with, or drew upon inspiration from the field of theology. Now, the contemporary field of religious studies is certainly not limited by the way theology has traditionally been conducted. In, in, in fact, a good number of our fellow religious studies scholars reject the suggestion that they are somehow tainted with theology in any narrow sense. And they're right in the, that the field of religious studies did not privilege any one religious tradition. It applies its analytic styles equally to any tradition or worldview. It brackets truth claims asserted by either the subject of the study or by the analyst studying it. And it takes seriously the social location in which a view of the world emerges and the social consequences of a particular way of thinking about reality. For this reason, religious studies scholars employ a wide range of literary analysis and methodologies from the social sciences. And yet, I think there's something poignant in noting that at this moment, at the beginning of the 21st century, that supposed great divide between theology and the secular study of religion has over time narrowed and blurred and sometimes been bridged. It's this renewed appreciation for the religious perceptions of reality in the study of social phenomena that characterizes what we call the socio-theological turn. It brings religious studies into a wider interaction with both theology and the social sciences. And it allows it to explore the socio-theological dimension of all aspects of society, from economic and political factors to matters of culture and social identity. So I suggest in the 21st century, we scholars of religion will continue to be employed, even if religion doesn't exist, or at least doesn't exist in the old way that we have imagined it to be. For religious ideas and images and social realities, of course, will continue to be worthy subjects of study, as will the epistemic worldviews, the perceptions of reality that animate them. Indeed, new worldviews arise all the time and they will involve new ways of thinking about them, new intellectual fusions and conceptual inventions. The old idea of religion and the great world religions may pass away <coughs> as we think differently about how the religious strata of the human imagination works in diverse social settings, and some of these settings will be new as the pluralistic globalized world bends towards new cultural interactions and fusions on a transnational page. Plain. Can we imagine, for example, a global religiosity in the coming century? Interestingly, one of this country's, one of this continent's uh, most perceptive political scientists, Suzanne Rudolph from the University of Chicago, has written movingly about the possibilities of transnational religion in a global age. In the very year that Susanna Rudolph was elected president of the American Political Science Association, she wrote these prophetic words for a project that I was involved in on religion and global civil society at Emory University. Suzanne Rudolph said that the thinning of state boundaries and the expansion of transnational political, social, and economic institutions and epistemes, she said, will in some day create the possibilities of a universal religiosity based on the premise that there is truth in all religions. Now what an interesting observation from a political scientist. She is right, one could see some of the recent figures of global moral stature playing a role in a pantheon of new transnational spirituality among these global saints might be the Hindu Mohandas Gandhi or the Christians Mother Teresa and Bishop Tutu, and the Buddhist, the Dalai Lama. And yet the old ideas of religious traditions will not pass away quickly, just like 
the nation state, the rumor of their deaths may be premature. One of the most prescient prognoses about the future of religion came from a former president of the AAR and one of the founders of the religious studies departments at both Lancaster University and the Santa Barbara campus of the University of California. And this is Ninian Smart. I had the occasion to ask Ninian, who had been my next door neighbor, who was a dear friend, to write an essay for a book that I was editing for Oxford University Press called The Oxford Handbook of, Handbook of Global Religion. I wanted him to write about the future of religion in a global age. As it turned out, this was his, to be his last essay. He put it down on my desk and walked out scarcely six days before his own untimely death. In this remarkable essay, Smith admitted that the future of religion was not all rosy. He said there would be a defensiveness about the old religious traditions that would certainly persist and could sometimes lead to violent protests against global secular modernity. In this essay, Smith prophesied that, and I quote, weapons of mass destruction might be used for religious purposes to destroy New York or some other city in which smart said be considered that would be the first moral crime, the first crime of the 21st century. So Smith turned out to be right. This was the first crime of the 21st century. It happened just as he described it, but he described it eight months before 9-11. He had the prescience to imagine even that event. But the essay was not all doom because he closed with imagining a different kind of role of religion in global society. He imagined the emergence of a spiritual and ethical dimension, a kind of global higher order of civility that would provide the cultural basis for international order and transnational regulations, a new form of religiosity that Smart predicted would be called the coming global civilization. What a remarkable thought this is this idea of Ninian Smarts, that a higher order of global civilization could be built on the moral sensibility and spiritual intuition of existing religious traditions. And Smart may well be right. Who knows? I mean, a hundred years from today, when scholars might be gathering in either in a physical setting like this or in cyberspace in a similar convention, Looking back at the last hundred years and observing the trajectory of the study of religion from 2009 all the way to 2109, they might still be marveling that the field is still in business, still flourishing, and still blossoming with new insights from the scholarly community, a scholarly community that then might be called the Global or even Galactic Academy of Religion. Until that happens, Happy birthday, AR, and thank you for your patience. And I'd like to invite you all to, the, uh, to the, our 100th uh, anniversary uh, reception, which is upstairs on the uh, escalators outside the door. <laughs>